few weeks, uh, a while, uh, we did uh, four messages on the book of Psalms. And I've been thinking about how to uh, bring the church into loving, studying the word, going to explore books of the Bible that sometimes we tend to overlook. And we spend a lot of time in the New Testament and the reading of the New Testament. We're very familiar. But there are some books that sometimes look a bit dark or violent or uh, uh, bloody that people sometimes are a bit afraid of. But the more I've been looking at the message of the prophets, I see how needed it is for us today. And I want to begin talking about it uh, today. Jesus Christ mentioned three great divisions in the Old Testament. Uh, and he says it in Luke chapter 24. There, these are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, what everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms had to be fulfilled. And then in these divisions, uh, we've already talked quite a lot about the Psalms and the importance and the encouragement, the comfort that they bring to, to us. But I want to spend some time talking more about the prophets. We have the major prophets, as you know, and the minor prophets. It's not about their importance. It's about the size of their writings. Uh, the major prophet wrote big books, and the minor prophets are more like letters or very short books. That's why they are called classified like this, but not according to importance of their message, because every message of the Bible are important. So any of these three books, for instance, Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, uh, any of them individual are larger than all 12 of the minor prophets. If you combine all the 12 minor prophets together, they are smaller in size than any of these one book alone, Jeremiah's Ezekiel of Isaiah. What is a prophet? The main word for prophet in the Old Testament is the word nabi, which means one who announces a message of, for God. And his message uh, is not his message. It is the message of God. He speaks from God and he speaks for God. He is like an ambassador. In the next slides, we will look at some of the characteristics of uh, these men. And uh, they were all called by, by God. They were conscious of God's authority. They, were, they spoke courageously and without compromise. They wouldn't be stopped by kings, false prophets, government officials, per prison or persecutions. They were men of integrity. Their character was beyond reproach. So they could not be stopped because of their behavior. They were men with deep communion with God. They faithfully and passionately denounced all evil practices. They were reformers, preachers of righteousness. They disturbed and difference that disturbs the conscience of the people of the time. They pointed out sins and the consequences of the sins that they would bring. They called everyone to repent. And they revealed the divine purpose of God. They had insight concerning punishments that would be coming and promises that would be coming if the people would turn. They had insight even in the messianic age. So this is very, very important. And I want to go back to number one because I have a, a scripture here. They were all called by God personally. This is important. In some of the texts we are familiar with, the next slide I think we will see, Isaiah, the calling of Isaiah. Would you please help me this morning with my voice? Instead of me reading, you would be the one reading. And so this one I can rest my, my voice as we are reading the scriptures. Would you please read Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. Then... Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5. This message from the Lord came to me. I knew you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart for me before you were born. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. The Lord stretched out his hand, touched my mouth, and then told me, Look, I put my words in your mouth. See, to 
today I promoted you to prophesy about nations and kingdoms, to pull up and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Ezekiel. And he said to me, Stand of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. So you see that it is very clear that each one of them had a very personal calling from God. God called them specifically, spoke to them, set them up with a very, very difficult missions. And if you look at more of the context of each of these calling, you will see that they, they debated with that. This, this was difficult. Isaiah saw the, the holiness of God and saw his own sinfulness. And it is out of that revelation that he, he submitted and he surrendered. So it was a very, very holy and specific moment. Jeremiah says, I am only a young man. I can't do that. I'm too young. And God said to him, you are not too young. Don't say you are too young because I will put my words into your mouth. And today I appoint you. And Ezekiel also struggles. And each one of them, they pay the big, big price for answering yes to God in their lives. It was a very difficult mission that God entrusted to them. But they were special men. In a way, we can say they were ordinary men just like us. But what made them special is their total allegiance to the Lord and their faithfulness and their complete surrenderings. No matter the cost, they would be the one that they would serve the Lord according to His calling. They were, the number two of the previous point, we said that they were conscious of God's authority behind their message. And it is confirmed by Peter. Peter says, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture has ever came from the prophet's own understanding or their own interpretation. Because there's a lot of people who prophesy anything. They just say, ah, this is what the Lord, I see something, I hear something, or whatever. But these prophets, they didn't do it from their own understanding or from human initiative. No these prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. And that is very clear when you read their writings and the history that come in their time. Hallelujah. The point of prophecy is not to give secret knowledge of the future because it's kind of exciting. And it's often the um, use to, to promote conference, prophetic meetings, pro come and we will tell you, it's like if I go to this conference, I will learn something about my future. But the prophets of the Old Testament were not into this kind of uh, sensationalism. They, they, they didn't seek the, these things. But they were there to motivate us to turn back to God. Always, you know, human nature, we always stand. To, to slow down, to fall away, to drift, to get distracted. We, we, we lose out a bit of the visions and we distend ourselves from the original love we had for God. Like we, we're all like that. This is who we are. This is the human na nature. So these people in Israel were not any different than, than we are today. Uh, and we will talk a bit more about it a bit later. But when they were prophesying, they were seeking to turn the people back, always turning people back, motivate people to turn back, and motivate to stay faithful, to remain faithful to God. One of the characteristics is that the, they would prophesy destructions and promises together. They, 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 that was part of their message. You know, and I think this is also a characteristic of what the good news is. When John the Baptist came, says, repent. When Jesus came, it was, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. And, and then uh, John the Baptist gave example as a prophet in this generation. You are charging too much money. You are dishonest. You are abusing your rights and your authority. You need to change your ways. So this is the good news. And the good news was in the Old Testament also. We think the good news is only coming in the New Testament, but the good news has always been the same news about the same God. God is love. 
God created this world to show his love to us. He created human beings for fellowship and he knows the devastating consequence of sin. So that is why God always spoke to us, sent us prophets to bring us back to him, to bring restoration and reconciliation. So the good news is very present and very mentioned in the Old Testament and throughout the Bible. But the nation of Israel, that was the nation set apart and chosen to be the light for the other nations, they turned away from God. We know that from history. And instead, they turned to worship pagan gods. And time and time again, throughout generations, God sent faithful prophets to warn Israel of the consequences of their evil ways. Why again? Why would God, time and time again, why not? Says, That's enough. Why not finish them off? Why time and time again? Why over this generation and the next generation, year after years, <coughs> you would do that? Because God, as we read in the Old Testament, God is slow to anger. You know, I've heard so many times, like I, I have a friend, and some of you know, know him here in Lighthouse, some of the older people. He says, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in the God of the Old Testament. I don't want to have nothing to do with the God of the Old Testament. He's too bloody, you know, and all of this. So there's a lot of people who grew up in Christian nations with the notions that God is an angry God. That God is a punishing God. Because you see so much blood in the Old Testament. But who is sharing the blood in the Old Testament? It's not God. It's the sinfulness of one tribe against another tribe. And the consequence of sinfulness that leads to, to evil consequence. In fact, let me show you some scriptures that will describe the, the intention and the desire and the concern of the God of the Old Testament for the nation of this world. In the next slide, I think. If you see these scriptures over here again, God says, I take no pleasures in the death of one who dies. In other words, the sinful man. Because it, it, it is in the context that the one who sin will die. That, that's the, the, the context of that chapter. You sin, you die. So in other words, if the father sin, but the son is righteous, the righteous son will live, the unrighteous father will die for his own consequence of his own sin. That's the context of that. But God says, I take no pleasure. This is not what I want. I don't want to punish. It's not my pleasure to just play around and kill people. I, it's not my pleasure. Therefore, turn and live. I want you to live. I'm just telling you how to, you can be escape punishment and death and, and live a life that is worthwhile, a, a life that is fruitful and, 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 a, good, and a good life. The verse, one of the favorite verse of all generation Christians, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and hope. This is God. The purpose that I have for you is for a future, a good one, bright, and all this. So this is when, when they were in exile, coming back from exile. I have something for you 70 years later. I want you to live. I have a future. I have a hope. You need to be punished because you are too evil right now. But you are going to live, and I'm going to bring you back. And then we have many scriptures that regard the future events, like in the millennium. And some of them are, are like this. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Nations shall not lift up swords against sword, neither shall they learn war anymore. This is the world that God has in view. This is, all this turned bad in the Garden of Eden. This is not the world that God wants. A world filled with sin and horrible violence that we, we see on TV every day. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. This is Old Testament prophecies. 
You see, well, I thought the Old Testament God was always angry and evil, like evil intent and trying to punish. That's not what it says. It says he will, will wipe away tears. The young women will dance for joy, and the men, old and young, will join in the celebration. Everybody will be dancing. How pleasant it is when you are in a conference somewhere, and then at the end, the Holy Spirit comes down, and people start dancing. Not lustful dance and sensual dance and uh, you know things like that, but just dance of joy. It's wonderful when we had a conference in China with the African brothers, even when I went to their wedding not too long ago in Wuhan. We dance in the Lord and we had so much fun. When you go to Spanish-speaking countries, you cannot have a church service without dancing. You, 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 have, to, you have to dance. And, and it is wonderful when you dance uh, in the Lord, when you can jump with joy joy and everything. And God is not against dance. God is for dance. He says the young women will be dancing. Last year when we went to Bangladesh, it was so dry at the beginning of the conference and at the, the, the end. You saw the video last year that I made. The last night, they just came up in the front with their traditional instrument and they started to, to dance and it was very spontaneous. They, the Spirit of God was moving in the heart. There was joy. There was freedom. They had met the Lord during these days and they were responding with dance. That's what God wants from us. When we meet with God to be joyful and to love Him and feel His love uh, all around us and loving one another to, so that we can rejoice in the Lord. Next slide. So then, if it is the nature of God and the desire of God that everything will be cool and, and good, what is the cause of the suffering that the prophets like Isaiah announced for his time and the end times? And look at the scriptures. We have an answer to that. God is speaking. What a sinful nation they are, loaded down with the burden of guilt. They are evil people. Corrupt children who have rejected the Lord, they have despised the Holy One of Israel and turned their back on Him. So whose fault is that? What, what is God trying to say to us today? God has to do something about the evil, the burden of evil, the corruptions, and that they, they have rejected God, they have despised, and not only, you see, because what happened in the society, when it says corrupt children, Corruptions corrupt. If you are corrupt, the first thing you want to do is corrupt your friend. Is corrupt the person you're with. And communicate this corruption. That's, the, the, that's what nature, sinful nature is. Not only, and Romans chapter 1 explained that, not only they are practicing sin that deserves death, but they want to bring others along. And Peter, it says in the letters to Peter, it says, when you see the light and you walk with Jesus, your former friends, they, they blaspheme you. They, they want to bring you back. They don't want to let you, to let you go and, and live in holiness with God. They, they want you back in sin. I have tried that. I have tried. When I, I've, I have tr tried to persecute other Christians before, when, before I, I, I got the, the, to see the light of Jesus and to receive, I have been trying to convince Christians to, to return. Oh, come on, it's so boring what you're doing. We are partying and all this. We, we, we don't understand the freedom in Christ, the, the joy and, and the future that we have in God. And all the ritual religious rituals in the world cannot cover up selfish sins because this world that is burdened with guilt and corrupt is also a very religious world. You go to any country, to any tribe, they can kill their neighbor, they can steal, they can lie, they can cheat their wives, they can do anything, but they still can go to church on Sunday. They still can burn uh, uh, incense on the altar, uh, wherever they go. They still can pray to God to bless them while they are doing evil during the week or whatever at work or anything. That's what human beings are made of. That's what we do. Uh, and so that's why it's, it says here, what makes you think I want all your sacrifice? Religion cannot cover for sin. God's not interested in uh, raising hands, singing songs, and, you know, and, and worship full of people if it is done in sin, if there is sinfulness. That's another example of that when Jesus says, when you go to the altar, 
If you have something against somebody else, stop. Settle your problem first. Come, come and offer me your sacrifice when your heart is free. If you hate somebody, don't come and tell me I love you, I love you God. Okay, and James says it also in the New Testament. The, the message of the Old Testament is preached and repeated in the New Testament, the same exact things. And Jesus, what we read here, says, God doesn't want I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls or anything. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not look. I'm fed up with that. Do you offer many prayers? I will not listen because your hands are covered with the blood of the violin. So Jesus says it in a different way in Mark 7. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. So worship works, is meaningful only if there is purity. It doesn't it say in the Bible, without holiness, no, no, no one can see the Lord. So you come to church, you may raise your hands the highest, you may sing the loudest. If there is something that is not settled in your heart, that's why we have the blood of Jesus. We have confessions, we have repentance, we have invitation from the New Testament to confirm this. Settle your problem, confess your sin, make it right before the Lord, then worship, worship fully. Amen? What is God's intention and solution if we continue in the same chapter of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16 and 20? This is what God wants of us. Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the cause of the orphans. Fight for the rights of the widows. Wow, the list is quite long, isn't it? Of, uh, the religion that God is looking for, there's a lot of social into that. And many times we leave it aside, we mystify our religious uh, experience. And of course, it's very important to be, uh, you know, end the presence of God and to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. But there is something practical here. This week we will have uh, pastors in Hong Kong, the conference for Hong Kong Church Network for the Poor at Solomon's Porch. And the whole day there will be workshops and speakers who are working in Hong Kong very, very diligently to change laws, uh, to um, uh, ameliorate the, the conditions of the poor in the society of Hong Kong, and churches coming together with plans and projects, very practical ways that we can all give a hand and participate. This is a type of religion that God takes pleasure in. So what God wants is wash yourselves and be clean. That's the message of the prophets. And that message is so timely today. It has no difference from the time there. So we have a part here. The first part is you wash yourselves and be clean. Ch change, change your life. Uh, and, and practice a religion that, that makes sense. And then God says, okay, this is what I'll do. You do that, and me, I will do this. Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. God is in, interested in forgiving, not in punishing. But he needs us to, to make a step, to turn back, to go to him for cleaning and to, to let go of our, of our sinfulness. And then it comes back to us, our, our choice. That's the message of the prophet. There's a choice here. Here is a punishment. Here is a promise of blessing. Here is going away from God, living independently. What is going to happen to you, to your family, uh, to your life, to your society? And here is, if you walk with me, what's going to happen? There's always the choice. And then you, you find it here. If you only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. It's very simple. You walk with God, stick close to God. God is going to bless you. Jesus says, don't worry about what you will eat, what you will do. Don't worry, your Heavenly Father knows. He will provide, seek Him first, and He will give you over abundant of anything that you want. He will take care of you. Don't be uh, afraid of that. That's what it says here. But if you turn away, 
If you choose to turn away, if you are indifferent, if you don't let your heart be softened by the Holy Spirit and refuse to listen, then you will be devoured by the sword. And this is what we see the consequences of our former Christian nations now going down <coughs> morally. Jeremiah 2, 17, 19. Whose fault is that? And you have brought this upon yourselves by rebelling against the Lord your God, even though he was leading you on the way. God was leading you. God wanted to bring you something good in your life, but you brought it upon yourself. Your wickedness will bring its own punishment. Your turning from me will shame, will shame you. You will see what an evil, bitter thing it is to abandon the Lord your God and not to fear him. I, the Lord, the Lord of heaven armies, have spoken. That's a strong message, but it's clear. We see in that message the balance message of the good news. And you see also the sovereignty of the Lord is stressed. And that is often lacking in our uh, New Testament and or sometimes in our teaching and our preaching. The sovereignty, the authority, the holiness of God, this needs to be exalted. And the prophets of the Old Testament did it very, very well. And we, that's why we need to go back to that. Recently, I've been listening to the book of uh, Jeremiah, and wow, I'm touched. Uh, every, every chapter touched me. I, I connect with uh, everything. I, I relate his message to what's happening uh, all around us. It's, it's a message for, for us today, even though a lot of it has to do with the events of the time. And, the, you know, they name the kings of the time, the place, and the type of sinfulness. And you, you, you have a feel that it is his story. But in fact, there's so much that is not history. That is human heart based, hum, human uh, nature based. That, that is what happened there, the way that God dealt with in this time is going to deal in the same way for us also. The Old Testament and the New Testament, there is no difference. Everything in the Old Testament, they were announcing there is a Messiah. When he will come, he will restore all things. He has come. But the message remains the same. Walk with him. Listen. Obey. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. My father will love you. I will love you. We will come to you. This is the same message as the Old Testament. There is no difference. There is no difference. Their message and their ministry. They function as preachers. They were really preachers. They explain and they reminded always they were bringing people back to the law and to the covenant. This is what God says. This is what God wants. This is what you promised to God. But this is how you are walking now. God cannot bless this. Change your ways. Come back to God. They, are, they were exhorting and challenging men to come back to the Lord. Hallelujah. And I want to finish with, with this. I'm skipping a bit because of that time. But what does that mean to us? The ungodliness and the days of the prophets, is it different from ungodliness in our days? Are the sins of Israel different from the sins of the New Testament? The sin of the New Testament violate the two greatest commandments. Love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your strength, with everything that is within you and love your neighbor as yourself. When we sin in the New Testament, we violate the law, the, the, the two commandments that fulfill the old law. People are the same today. We may have new gadgets, we may have iPhones 6S, we may have uh, different fashions and uh, appearance, but the, the heart's condition hasn't changed. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? God knows how bad it is. And because he loves us so much, he has kept his prophet 
He has sent more prophets, one generation after the others. Some of them, uh, Isaiah, I think, prophesied for about 60 years. Jeremiah, about 40 years. That's a lot of time. Like we read that and it's like, it looks like it's short time. But over like five kings and uh, four kings and, and it's a lot of time. These people, the, one generation after another generation. I'm sick. I'm 62, so that's the the time from uh, my birth in 1950s until 2000 something. That's a lot of years for someone to to prophesy uh, faithfully. Brother Steve is uh, 88; will be turning 89, uh, and he is still a preacher of righteousness. So these are people who have uh, persevered into into this that. Is the if okay, I want to finish with that slide, uh, the the one uh, First Peter one eleven. Listen to the message of the Old Testament prophets, interpreted by Peter. It, this is a very special uh, text here. This is talking about the prophets of the Old Testament, concerning the message, the inspiration, the goal, and what the revelation that they were receiving but it is brought to us today. Don't read too fast. Wait for me. Wait for me, okay? Uh, listen to that. What's the question I want to ask you? Is the message of the prophets relevant to us today? And we will see because Peter is taking the message of the Old Testament, the revelation they've had, and he's talking to us in the New Testament. Let's see if it is relevant for us today. Because many times we look at the books of the Old Testament which says, Wow, oh, I, 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 I'm in a hurry to, to read through that. I, I want to, next time I'm going to read in the New Testament, because now, now I have spent enough time in the Old Testament, because you see like, uh, all this. But this is what, what Peter says. The prophets, they wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory. Afterwards, they were told that their messages were not for themselves, the prophets, but their message was for who? Hello? Are you there? The message was for you, for us. And now this good news, the good news that comes out from their message but greater, more glory in Christ, has been announced to you by those who preach in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Now the apostles of Jesus Christ, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, are communicating to us this message. They, are connect, they have connected the message of the prophets with the life of Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ has done and who He is. They have made the connections and they have completed more uh, f clearly what the good news of God is. It is so wonderful that even the angels are, are eagerly watching these things happen. So now is the practical uh, application. Let's see if the practical exhortations of Peter match with the practical exhortations of the prophets of the Old Testament. See there are any similarities. It says, oh no, in the New Testament it's all grace. We don't think about anything that we have to do. Don't do this. You must do that. We don't have that in the New Testament. Let's see if it is true. So think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. It's not an option here. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your sinful or own desires. You didn't know any better then. You were blind. But now you must be holy in everything you do. Wow. That's quite a command. You must be holy. Be focused. Set apart your life and everything that you do. Your life belongs to God. Walk with God. Stay close to God. G everything you have belongs to God. Your life, your future belongs to God. Just as God who chose you is 
holy. Amen? Amen? So I would say, and I'm sure you would agree, that the prophets of the Old Covenant, they do indeed have a message for us today. Amen? Amen. Let us stand.